Welcome everyone to day three of our Amazon Virtual Summit. I'm Rick Backus, CEO of CPC Strategy, and today is the final day of our summit. Uh, it's been a huge success uh, for, for us and for Seller Labs and for Feedvisor, and we're excited to have Shmuley from Feedvisor join us today uh, to finish out the summit. Before we turn it over to Shmuley, I just want to go into a little bit more information about CPC strategy. If you've been on the uh, webinars for the last two days, you've seen the same slide. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, our company, I founded the company with my three business partners in 2007. We have over 250 active retail clients. Uh, we're a top 50 fastest growing company in San Diego for three years running. Uh, we're one of only 10 officially recognized Google Shopping Partners, and we focus exclusively on retail. Also, we just launched our site. Uh, it took us about, realistically, it's been about six months worth of work um, from the concept to the initial mock-ups to the launch of the new cpcstrategy.com, and we're still making tweaks and, and changes to it. So if you have any feedback on our new site, uh, we would love to hear from you. You can actually email me directly. My email is rick at cpcstrategy.com. And uh, the last two days, I've received some great feedback. And so please keep that coming. We, we genuinely appreciate it. A little bit of webinar housekeeping. So stay tuned for the webinar recording email. If you've missed any portions of the, the three webinars the last three days, um, they're all going to be emailed to you next week. Uh, so you know, feel free to, to pass on those webinars to anyone else who might be interested. If you missed any portion of today's webinar, uh, don't worry, we will follow up with a recording. Also, John, who heads up our marketing team, is currently fielding questions in the chat box, and he will uh, go over those questions with Shmuley and myself at the end of the presentation today. So uh, fire away with those questions. We've been typically doing about 20 to 25 minutes worth of Q&A uh, the first two days on the webinars, and so please keep those, those questions coming, and um, I've been really happy with the Q&A sessions with both Pat uh, and Jeff, and I'm sure today those sessions will be excellent with Shmuley as well. A little bit more about Shmuley, he is the Director of Marketing at Feedvisor. Uh, he's a former Senior Technology Evangelist and Director of Marketing at, for Clicktail, and he has over six years experience in this space. I've personally seen Shmuley present before, uh, and his presentations are, are awesome. Uh, we kind of set up the, the webinar or the summit in a fashion where you know, Pat was trying to provide a foundation for your Amazon knowledge. Uh, Jeff from, or I'm sorry, Paul from Seller Labs was brought on to, to give you more detail around the search algorithm, and so getting a little bit more, more technical, Paul, Paul shared a bunch of, of tests that they've done at Seller Labs to figure out exactly how the search algorithm works. And today, uh, Shmuley is going to be doing a deep dive into the Amazon Buy Box. So uh, right here, that's exactly what I just said, deep dive into the Amazon Buy Box, and it's important to Amazon sellers. Uh, Shmuley is also going to break down the variables that determine Buy Box ownership. He'll show you how to use the metrics within Seller Central to your best advantage and he'll analyze the techniques being used by the top buy box winners today. And then John will join us for the Q&A. Uh, real quick, before I turn it over to Shmuley, I just want to thank all of the attendees, especially those of you who have been here with us for all three days. Uh, we put in a lot of effort to making sure that the content is providing value, um, but we know that, that your time uh, and attention is hard to earn. And so thank you. We genuinely appreciate it. With that being said, I'm going to turn over the uh, presenter to Shmuley so that he can show his screen. Are you there, Shmuley? Yeah, I'm here now. Awesome. So I just gave you control, and I'll let you know when we can see your screen. Superb. Yep, yeah, it's all yours. Wonderful. Well, guys, thanks again for joining us tonight, and a thanks to Rick and John and all the guys over at CBC Strategy for putting together what I think so far has been a a superb uh, conference and we're, we'll do our best to round it up and leave you all on a high. <clears throat> Tonight we're going to discuss something which is, and if it's not, should be, close to every single Amazon seller. 
and that is winning the Amazon buy box. The reason why we place such an emphasis on that buy box is because of the sheer dollar value of that one little yellow buy now button. $82 billion of sales from last year, that's not even 2015, that's 2014, went through the buy box. And of those sales, they're normally responsible for 95% of a third party seller's revenue. Now, because of the way the buy box works, and we'll discuss this in length very quickly, <coughs> the buy box actually pays back sellers for delivering a great customer service because it allows you to raise your prices and still win the buy box even though you're more expensive than a competitor as long as your customer service metrics are good, as long as your seller ratings and your shipping times is good. And this essentially means that the buy box is a place where sellers compete on their merits and on their experiences, not for their marketing spend and not for their ability to promote themselves. So, before we dive in, let me take a step back. Who am I? Uh, as Rick said, my name is Shmuley Goldberg. <coughs> I am an analytics geek. Uh, 18 months ago, we wrote the book uh, called The Buy Box Bible, which looked at the time on of hundreds of millions of buy box changes, buy box wins, buy box losses. We had a team at the time of three data scientists that all they did was uh, analyze this data and find out as much as we could about how Amazon uses the buy box and what metrics are given and what weights are given to each metric. This was 18 months ago, so we've now hit three years of research. We have a team today of 25 data scientists and on a daily basis we watch 25 million price changes over the space of time that we've been doing this experiment and we're still running it. We've watched billions of price changes, and every single time we see who wins the buy box, why, what are the conditions, what are the market conditions, what is price elasticity. This is all the data that goes into our technology and goes into our algorithm, and, and the core of all this is our data scientists and the, and the algorithm that we've put together. <coughs> so, today we're going to have uh, about 30 minutes to take a proper deep dive into the Amazon buy box itself. We're going to be looking into the variables themselves that determine buy box ownership, and the word ownership I'll, I'll discuss in a minute is, is probably the best way to put it. We're going to look at how you can use these metrics to actually work with the buy box and take best advantage of your own position. And finally, we'll be looking at techniques used today by some of the world's largest sellers to win the buy box. So, Let's start with the basics. What is the buy box? This is the fundamental rule that you need to understand about the Amazon buy box. And if you don't know this, then you know, paint it on the walls of your office and keep it up there for always to see. The Amazon buy box is an algorithm that sole purpose is to give the end customer the best value for money. And when we say best value for money, we mean best bang for its buck, best mixture, if you will, of sales of competitive prices and the quality seller. So it does this by determining which product offering, as you know, sometimes there can be 10, 20, 50 sellers selling the same offering, but it works out which of these offers the seller a high seller performance at a low cost price. It never looks at extremes, it never looks at the cheapest or the best. It tries to understand that balance that gives the customer the best possible value for their money. So the customer may pay a little bit more to get a lot better seller, or will pay a little bit less to get a worse seller. Now as we said, the buy box isn't really a question of having the buy box or not, because one thing that we've learned very, very quickly is the buy box rotates. These are what we call rotations. Um, internally we call it ownership. But again, any term will do. The concept here is that on any given day, roughly 100 spots are open for buy box wins. The buy box changes every 15 minutes. That's 96 times a day. <coughs> so if you can imagine, if there were 10 sellers, each of perfectly equal metrics and perfectly equal price, they'd all go on rotation, and each seller will get roughly 10% of the day. Now, 
if there's a higher seller, if there's a if there's a seller in there who's got a significantly lower price with a similar metric, or he's got much better metrics at the same price, or some mixture of those two, he will take a share of the buy box, he will own a share of the buy box based on the statistics that Amazon have calculated that he's the best seller. So if there's a 70% chance that you're the best guy out there, you're going to win 70% of the buy box. If there's a, only a 30% chance, then you're only going to win 30% of the buy box. And remember, when you're in the buy box, you're making sales. When you're not in the buy box, you're really you know, trying to grab those customers who click on the buy more options. The really interesting thing about the buy box recently is how it works on mobile. Mobile has changed the way <coughs> that we look at the Amazon buy box significantly because of the way it looks on the screen. This is a screenshot of how uh, a specific item looks on Amazon mobile and you'll see that the add to car button there, the buy box button there, is almost the only thing the customer sees. So if on a standard web browser, as we know, it's 82 to 84 percent of sales go through the buy box, we predict that on a mobile device, it's over 98 percent because you can't even see the options to see more other sellers. The more buying choices button is, is way down the page. Nobody ever gets there because within this one screen, Amazon have given you everything you need. So the fact that this is sold by Amazon or a third party seller or an FBA merchant, an FBM merchant, is almost irrelevant to the seller, sorry, to the customer at this stage. <coughs> so we're going to try and, and move through this. Lots and lots of questions normally come up at this stage. Please feel free to ask. Um, I know John. John is, is standing by, excited to get all your questions and we'll tackle them all one by one at the end. Let's look at the buy box. We're going to talk, as we said, about the requirements and the variables first of all. <coughs> so, there are four levels of variables that have a significant impact on the buy box. There's in, there are variables that have a high impact, very high impact, and then a medium and a low. <coughs> the very high impact variable, as we call it, the mother of all variables, a fulfillment method. If you choose to sell your items through FBA, you are almost guaranteed to win the buy box if everything else is equal. And I want to say those words very carefully. You're almost guaranteed because, again, there can still be somebody out there better than you, and we'll see that in a few minutes. And again, if everything else is equal. So if you're a 98% seller competing against another 98% seller, and you have the same price, or even a slightly higher price, you're able to win the buy box. <clears throat> and the really cool thing is, is that one of the things we do as a price engine is we see how much higher you can go if you are FBA than FBM and still win that buy box. And we've seen that a seller who's FBA can sometimes go 15 to 20 percent higher in their prices when then compared to an FBM seller and still win the buy box, still maintain that that magical spot that they need to be in order to make their money. But again, this is a business decision. There is no be all and end all rule for every business, whether to go FBM or whether to go FBA. Um, both CPC Strategies and I have recent, recently released a whole other white paper just on this topic. There are advantages and disadvantages to all fulfillment methods, but the buy box win is a, is a key reason why many sellers today do choose to go FBA. Now, moving on, there are three high impact variables. And all of these variables have a significant effect on the buy box. <coughs> the first is your seller rating. Amazon, as you know, give a score for every sale you make. And the average of this is called your seller rating. You get 110 points for a perfect score, 100 for if you have no problems, zero for small problems, and then you lose 100 or 500 points, depending on major problems that you may have. The average of this score is called your seller rating. And when it comes to the buy box, and this is very, very interesting to know, Amazon divide these scores and put you into one of six brackets. You're either in the 100 to 98 percent category, you could be in the 97 to 95, 94 to 90, 89 to 80, 79 to 70, and then below 70. 
And these brackets are very, very, very important because while the absolute number is important, so for example, if you're a 92 or a 93, that makes a big difference. If you can move between the brackets, that is, for example, jumping from a 89 to a 90, is going to have a much bigger impact. So the higher your brackets, the higher your buy box share. But jumping from one bracket to another will nearly always have a stronger effect on the buy box than if you move between the brackets themselves. So moving from, for example, 96 to 97 is never going to be as effective as moving from 97 to 98. And we'll get back to this in a few minutes when we talk about uh, tactics and strategies to maintain high buy box share. <coughs> the, se the second high impact variable is shipping time. And just like accelerating, these are divided into brackets as well. There's 0 to 2 days, 3 to 7, 8 to 13, and then 14 plus. And the same thing holds true. Moving between these brackets has a much greater effect on your buy box share than moving within a bracket itself. And again, this is something which is, is very useful when discussing how to work with the buy box. The third high impact variable, and the one that we have the most experience with, is your landed price. The reason why landed price is unique is because it's the easiest variable for you as the seller to manipulate. You cannot always change your shipping time. And you definitely know that it's very hard to change your seller rating. So price is, if in a small way, that only lever within this high impact variable concoction that you can easily move up and down in order to most efficiently win the buy box. It's the only metric that you can literally in a couple of minutes directly control and completely take over the buy box or completely throw it away. Now with price there's no brackets. Every single penny counts and again Amazon look at landed price. So that's the price including shipping and everything else. It's the price that it comes to the customer's door in. Now because of this lever there's a very unique advantage about the price. When you take other metrics into account, you'll notice that the higher your relative metrics are, and when I say relative metrics, I'm talking about your metrics as relative to other sellers selling the same item, the higher you can raise your price. And this is exactly what we said at the beginning about improving your customer service really pays for itself within the Amazon marketplace. Because if you're slowly but surely building up your credibility, making sale after sale, keeping your scores high, keeping your shipping times down and your customers happy, all that money that you put into giving the customer the best possible experience, a good repricer would take advantage of and will slowly raise your prices pennies by pennies on all your items. And this can very much be seen as the dollar value, the payback of improving this customer service. <clears throat> so now that we've discussed the, the biggest variable, which is fulfillment method, and the high variable, which is shipping time, accelerating, and landed price, there are a couple medium impact variables that we're going to skim through. Um, each one of these, by the way, is not going to have as much of an effect as the other ones, because these metrics are usually used as deciding votes. So if all other metrics are equal, let's say you have two FBM sellers who are both selling 98% success rate, are both in the zero to two brackets of shipping time, and are both the same or similar prices, then these metrics will come in and decide based on a kind of a swing vote system. However, an extreme case of a medium variable, so if the um, you have a medium variable which is very, very low, or a medium variable which is very, very high, it can have an impact just as much as a high or the very high rating. And this is because the buy box, again, looks at overall chances of you being a great seller. So if you've got a medium variable which is massive, and Amazon recognizes that this makes you a unique kind of standout case as a perfect seller, it can have a positive impact. In the same way, if any one of these medium variables fall too low, Amazon's not going to trust you, and therefore, no matter how good your other metrics are, it's simply not going to work. So, 
there are several categories of these. There are a total of 16, um, and the truth is it's, it's a lot of time to go through each and every one, but we're kind of going to cover the topics. So the first of these medium impact variables are the order defect rate statistics, and there's a few in there, such as negative feedback rate, etc. And your delivery history, such as on-time delivery, late shipment, etc. So these groups of metrics, any extreme positive or negative can have an effect. But as a general rule, you want to spend your time and efforts on the larger metrics and just kind of keep those in the safe zone. Because if you're really going to spend time improving this, it's going to take a lot of time and effort from you. There are other uh, variables that fall in this medium impact thing, such as feedback score, which is one, two, three, four, or five star ratings that you get back from the customers. Customer response time, which by the way is also bracketed, so it's 0 to 6 hours, 6 to 12 hours, and 12 to 24, and feedback count. And feedback count simply means the number of feedback you have in total so far as a seller. Now, on the next slide, I'm going to show you something interesting. I'm going to show you a, a snapshot from our algorithm. And the reason I want to pick this up is to show you what I mean about a really strong metric having a great effect. So looking at feedback count, uh, this next slide is a small snapshot of one second in time on Amazon. And don't forget, we're making pricing decisions 25 million times a day. So this is one 25 millionth, if you will, on one item, on one seller, in one specific instance. Now the red line you can see just lost the buy box. But the interesting thing is if you look, this is an FBA seller. This is somebody who fulfills by Amazon. I don't know how well you can see my mouse, but I'm going to try pointing over here. You can see under the landed price, which is the third column from the right-hand side, that the FBA seller is selling this item, which I believe was a watch, for $705. But the line that you can see yellow just above it was an FBM seller. This is a, a merchant fulfilled seller who is selling at $707. So the merchant fulfilled seller was more expensive than the FBA seller. And if you look at the other metrics, they're both the shipping times in the 0 to 2 day bracket. The seller feedback is in the 95 to 97, so they match exactly. But the reason why the FBM seller was able to win the buy box and beat an FBA seller is because the FBA seller, as you can see, has 3,500 seller feedback counts in his life. But the FBM seller, the Merchant Fulfilled Seller, has 360,000. So that's 100 times more feedback. And because he's had so much positive feedback in the past, and he's maintained 95 to 97% score, Amazon is giving him the sale at a higher price than the FBA seller. Now, this is a, a unique case, because to have any seller with 360 positive feedbacks, sorry, 360,000 positive feedbacks is rare. We were talking about the um, tactics that you can do nowadays in order to see, in order to win this buy box. Hey, Smully, we're, we're actually not seeing your, there we go, we're back to seeing your screen again. Okay, again guys, I cannot apologize enough for the technical glitches this evening. <clears throat> so, as you were saying, we would look at active strategies and tactics that you can actually do today in order to win buy box share. So we're going to look at three strategies this evening and they all come down to the same core theory, which is that your goal is always to improve one or more relative metrics <coughs> without forfeiting performance in other areas. In order to do this, you have one simple challenge, which is to identify which changes would have the biggest effect on the buy box share at the lowest business cost to you. So you want to identify those few metrics that you know you can manipulate and improve at the lowest cost, even sometimes if that means letting go of other metrics. So we can see here a perfect example of this. These are your seller central metrics. You should always, always know your metrics. So you can see at any time what's good, what are you getting all your ticks for, and what's bad. Where are you hurting yourself in terms of actually losing buy box without realizing it? 
And once you have an understanding of this, you're able to essentially <coughs> sacrifice one metric for another. You're able to give up on a part of your seller central metrics that is not contributing largely to your buy box share in order to gain another area. <coughs> for example, we've discussed that one of the things that works on a smaller level on low impact variable is the response time to customers. So yes, if you can get back to customers straight away, it's going to have a positive impact on your buy box share. But your seller rating has a much greater effect. So instead of spending those extra hour a day making sure that you get back to customers as fast as possible, you should spend that hour a day if you need to, if your seller rating is not high enough, getting back to old customers and asking them politely, groveling, doing everything that you can so that they remove negative feedback. <coughs> Again, a positive sale on Amazon gets you 100 points, but a negative one nets you minus 500, which means that you need to get at least 50 more positive scores just in order to balance out the percentage at the end of the day. One negative score brings down your overall positive much quicker than a positive brings it back up. So instead of spending time on the low metrics such as the ODR rate or your feedback time, as long as these don't slip too far down, so if your ODR rate instead of being, you know, goes from 0.4% to 0.6%, but in order to achieve that you're able to free up some time to then contact old sellers and get them to remove their negative feedback, that's a very strong way to improve your buy box share. Now in this same vein, there's a second tactic and this is used almost exclusively by some of the best Amazon sellers I know. People that get this and people that know how to do this are able to have a huge impact with very little effort. And it's about the brackets. As we've said before, jumping between the brackets has a much greater impact than moving within a bracket itself. And you can use this to your advantage when you remember that the three metrics that use brackets are seller rating, shipping time, and customer response time. But both seller rating and shipping time are high impact variables. So you have to learn to spot quick wins. You have to learn to spot, for example, moments when your seller rating is 97%. Because doing everything you can just to up it from 97 to 98% is a brilliant use of your efforts because the payback is going to be exceptional. On the flip side, if your seller rating is 95%, you've got quite a way to go till you hit that 98% number to jump up a bracket, so as long as you don't slip, perhaps this isn't the area in your business that you should be putting all the efforts. The same is true with shipping time that if you can ship that one day earlier, the question should always be, will that extra day get me up a new bracket? If it will, go for it. And if not, it's still valuable, but maybe there's other points in your business that you can put the effort. You should always be very, very careful in the same vein to avoid near misses. So the points where your seller rating goes from, let's say, for example, 93 to 92, it's not the end of the world. 92 to 91 is not great, but it's not disaster. But once you hit that 90 point, moving down to 89 could seriously impact your buy box potential. So at this point, you've got to turn around to your team and go, guys, for the next two weeks, whatever happens, we return every order, we keep every customer happy, we have to stay within this bracket so as not to hurt ourselves in the future by losing buy box share. <clears throat> the third tactic, and this is something which, again, I'd recommend, you know, once you've got this presentation, the video, print this out, tattoo it on the inside of your arm, make sure that everyone that you work with you knows this off by heart. Learn your no-go zones. These are the points that any of your metrics drop below, you almost instantly lose the buy box. And again, there's no uh, fixed extremes here because as we saw, the buy box can be swayed by many metrics. But dropping below any of these metrics will severely handicap you when it comes to winning that one spot. So your seller rating never should be below 70%. Your on-time delivery should never be below 97. Tracked orders should 
ideally never go below 98 and your late shipping rate should always be above 4%. Now you'll notice with these four metrics, so with these last three metrics, that if you're using an FBA account, if you're fulfilling by Amazon, these are always going to be perfect scores. And this goes to some way to explain why an FBA seller gets such a high chance of winning the buy box, because he's never going to slip in any of these categories Amazon themselves are fulfilling. Additionally, your cancellation rate should always be above 2.5%. You should always ship within four days, 14 days. And you, for your customer response time, you have to make sure that no more than 10% of your messages ever go past the 24-hour mark. If you have 10 or 15% of your messages that you don't get back to within the first 24 hours, again, you're severely handicapping your chance to win the buy box. So we ran a couple of minutes over there due to the technical difficulties, but this really wraps up everything that we had to say today. Um, I'd be more than happy to take any questions regarding the buy box, the variables itself, or anything else that you wish to ask. John, over to you, sir. Hey, Johnny, there. Yeah, thank, thank you, Shmoli. Uh, Rick, do you have any questions to start off with? Um, I do, and I'm also, could you turn back control of the screen? I'll, I'll put up our last few slides. Sure, happy to. Yeah, I just did that. Okay. Ah, superb. So, there we go. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to enter into the Q&A portion of the webinar. Uh, first of all, Shmuley, I thought you recovered brilliantly. That has never happened to me. I've done uh, a lot of webinars before. I've never had my computer crash in the middle of the webinar. I can only imagine uh, your frazzled uh, state of mind for a few minutes when you were probably <laughs> I, freaking out. So, yeah, I'm almost grateful recovery. I couldn't hear the language that I was using when it did go down. <laughs> yeah, it was probably for the best that we couldn't hear the, the language you <laughs> were uh, Also, I, on, the, on Tuesday, uh, we coined the term the Amazon Whisperer for Pat. And Paul, uh, since he from Seller Labs, uh, he was the Walter White of Amazon. I think that the name that is most appropriate for you is the Buy Box Burglar, because Feedvisor helps <laughs> helps I'll take that steal. Yep, yeah, helps to steal the com the competition's Buy Box. And so yeah, we're gonna go with the Buy Box Burglar. Um, I have a couple questions. I have a couple questions for you before John jumps into the audience question. You had said um, 15 to 20 percent higher prices if you have FBA and your competitor doesn't, uh, where does that number come from and how should, how should sellers go about testing that? Because I think that there's this misconception with, uh, with, uh, with repricing software that there's kind of a race to the bottom and a lot of the stuff that, that you talked about was actually if you put in the effort to raise your seller metrics that oftentimes it's going to lead to increased profits by raising your prices, and so could you do, you go into that 15 to 20 percent number a little bit more? I'd be happy to. Um, so the way, again, I'm not trying to use this as a, as a plug for our own technology, but this is exactly where the number comes from. The way our algorithms work is that we look at hundreds of millions of price changes every single minute, and of those price changes, we see what effect they have on the buy box share. So we watch people go up, we watch people go down on a product level, on a category level, on an individual seller level, and on a SKU level. And what we often notice is that the amount of what we call price elasticity, that's kind of the, the, how much you can stretch your price and still maintain the same value and get the same sales, uh, is much higher with FBA sellers. So what our algorithm does is essentially, if it recognizes that you have any metrics, be it, you know, obviously um, fulfillment is a key one, but any key metric better than another seller, we will try and raise your price based on the amount that we know that you're able to go and still win the buy box share. And we do this again by seeing so many price changes and learning exactly how much value Amazon places on being you know, an FBA seller versus an FBM seller, or being a two-day shipper versus a six-day shipper. And what we do is, as it's a learning algorithm, every 15 minutes, it looks, it sees the effectiveness of your last price change, it calculates the odds of being able to increase it more or less, and it takes that chance and it learns again. So we've seen, for example, that if, if an FBM seller is around the $20 mark, 
we can raise an FBA set of prices, you know, little by little, dollar by dollar, penny by penny, until we get to about uh, $23, $23.50, and at this point, you're still winning 70 or 80% of the buy box share. So this for you is kind of your, your golden price, it's your optimum price. So instead of dropping prices, and again, as you said, this is a fallacy which has been created by rule-based repricing. Because rule-based repricing says, if I'm competing against a $20 seller, set my price to $19.99. Mm -hmm. If he's FBA versus FBM, then I want to go $2 lower instead of one penny lower. And all this does is it causes prices to drop. We work fundamentally by going in the other direction. We look at everything we can, all your metrics as a seller, all your competitor sellers. We look at the price elasticity. We look at demand for a specific item. We look at trends to see if the item is becoming more expensive or cheaper. And based on this, we will change your prices continuously. And as I said, specifically with FBA versus FBM, we can raise the price 15 to 20% higher and still win the buy book share. I mean, the example you saw beforehand showed the opposite. It showed that the FBM seller was our customer. Yeah. And we were able to raise his price $2 more than an FBA seller in the buyer box because we identified a golden metric. But the fulfillment, fulfillment itself is often that one golden metric that we need in order to be able to raise prices. That's awesome. Yeah, that was, is a perfect answer. And I think that it's, it's something that a lot of sellers don't realize that, that when you have a firm hold on the buy box, you know, you can raise prices and it's in your best interest to raise prices to figure out the price point where you can maintain, maintain the buy box. And so uh, I have a few other questions, but I, I want to make sure that we get to the, uh, the, as many audience questions as we can. So I'm going to turn it over to John to field some of those audience questions. Awesome. Thank you, Rick. And really great, great presentation today. Um, so let's just jump right into it because we have a ton of questions here. Um, so, Eliana has a question that a lot of other people um, have kind of touched on, but I guess it's kind of a broad question. How can a third-party merchant or third-party seller compete against Amazon for the buy box? <laughs> That's something we hear a lot. <clears throat> um, it's very, very doable. We have a lot of our sellers competing against Amazon on a daily basis. There's two ways to do it. There's the ideal way to do it, which is keep your metrics high enough which means that at a similar price to Amazon, you'll be able to take maybe 10 to 20 percent of the buy box, and then if you lower your prices a little bit, can sometimes get that to 30 to 40 percent of the buy box. So even though Amazon's there, you can be selling it maybe a couple of pennies under, or sometimes even at the same price, and still take the buy box away from it. And this is because Amazon only cares about the customer experience. It sounds weird to say, but Amazon, the marketplace, don't value Amazon, the seller, any higher than anyone else. The only reason they keep on winning the buy box is because they've got you know, the same metrics as God. They are essentially perfect. If you're near to perfect, or even better, if you are perfect, you can and should often beat them to the buy box. You might not get 100% share, as we said, but if you're picking up an item that Amazon's selling, which means that chances are it sells more than other third-party items, even 20 to 30% of that market share is very, very good. <clears throat> the second answer is that if you're competing against Amazon, you don't have such great metrics. You're an average seller, you've got 95, 94, you've got three or four day shipping rate, then you can still, still compete against Amazon if you can get your prices low enough. This isn't an answer that most people want to hear, but the truth is that if you can source cheaper or you're willing to go on a smaller profit margin, you can get your prices to the point where you can win buy box. And again, if you've got a decent repricer, you'll be able to get just to that point and not a penny lower. You want to get just to that point where you're low enough to beat Amazon at their own game without sacrificing too much profit. It's, it's difficult because you either need to have great customer service or be willing to drop your prices, but it's definitely doable, and we have customers that compete against Amazon on a daily basis. Great. And, and, and kind of along those lines, going back to that slide, um, you don't have screen control right now, but to refer back to that slide um, where you showed the, the, the seller that had over 300,000 seller reviews, um, I, I guess, could you speak towards... Um, the importance of seller feedback in terms of buy box ownership and, and kind of was that just an anomaly case where you don't see that at all um, but 
it, I guess it shows it's possible to win a buy box on seller rating. Um, uh, yeah, it wasn't a true anomaly case because the truth is the algorithm exact acted exactly like we would expect it to. It found a really strong metrics and it gave them the buy box share. It's only an anomaly because these metrics of you know 300,000 positive reviews are very rare to find on a marketplace that has large seller turnover. People come and go the whole time. That was the only reason why it was an anomaly. But we do see this the whole time. <coughs> seller feedback itself is, is critical. And as we said, the most important thing about your seller rating is your, your ratio of positive to negative. If you can keep that ratio of positive to negative above that 98%, you're in the golden bracket. Because then, once you're above 98, you're 98.01, you're counted almost exactly like somebody with 100%. Because that top bracket is really one of the places where you really should strive to be. The same way that being an FBA seller means that you can raise your prices by 10 or 15 percent, or 20 or sometimes even 15 to 20 percent. I haven't got the numbers at hand, but being in that top bracket for seller feedback against other sellers who are comparatively lower, they're in the 90 to 92 bracket, can also mean you can raise your prices by, you know, sometimes even over 10 percent. I haven't got the numbers of that to hand, but within that that feedback score is one of the places where you have the biggest chance to actually have a long-term effect on your business. Feedback is slow to change. Once you're in that bracket, if you hit 98, 99, 100, especially when you've got several thousands of sales under your belt, it's going to do you in good stead. It's kind of like a, an uplifting wind for your business because then you've got leeway to drop from 100 back to 99 then back to 100, then 99, then 98, then 99, and that whole time you're in that top bracket. So number of feedback is, is very important, as you saw, but it's a medium impact. The most critical thing is the quality of the feedback and the positive reviews that you get. Great. Thank you, Shmoli. Um Kind of going towards uh, seller rating, um, you mentioned the brackets for seller rating. I guess, how do you tell which bracket you're in? And then on a little bit more cut and dry note, um, is that is seller rating based off 7, uh, 30, 90 day, or 12 month data? So this is a good question. It's judged on all of them, but it looks most importantly at the last 30 days. Ah, okay. So this is something that you know our algorithm goes into. We didn't uh, have the time to go into that today, but your last 30 days are the most important. If you know, your last 30 days are equal to somebody else's, then maybe 60 and 90 days would also count. Your historical overtime positivity is not as important as your historical overtime number of sales. But in the last 30 days, that's where, uh, that's where most of the weight is put when it looks at your positive feedback score. Great. Um, I guess to kind of switch gears towards um, brands um, and, and buy box, uh, it sounds like we got a lot of brands uh, on the webinar and we've gotten a lot of questions from them and it seems like the general consensus is that um, if you're a brand who's a third party seller on Amazon, you have some sort of advantage in terms of winning the buy box. Uh, I think I know what the answer is to this, but I guess, what is your experience with that? Yeah, it all comes down to the competition. Maybe this is what you were thinking, but if, you've, if you have an item which is non-competitive, meaning you, that you're the only person who sells this specific item, then you're going to win the buy box. Unless you really screw up big time, in which case Amazon you know, have, have, have no trust in you and it just says there's no buy box winner, see buying choices. As long as your metrics are pretty decent, not even great, but just good enough, and you're the only person selling a specific item, you're going to win the buy box every single time. And in these cases, to be perfectly honest, the skills and the tactics that we talk about have a lesser effect. You don't go near the nose no go zone, you want to be very sure that you keep your metrics above those critical points, but as long as you're okay, if you're the only person selling an item, you're always going to win the buy box, so it's not much of a challenge for you. In these cases, you should be focusing a lot more on what you've learned the last two nights, which is kind of getting people to find your items and getting them to your page in the first place. Great, great. So, so I guess another brand question, um, obviously we know landed price is a strong buy box factor. Um, I guess if you're a brand competing for the buy box against um, other third-party resellers, um, is there anything you can do to address uh, resellers that um, 
are un unauthorized resellers selling below map pricing. Um, obviously, because that it's it's frustrating if you're a brand and you don't win the buy box for your for your own product. Um, I, I guess it, this might not fall under your expertise, but do you know if any if there's anything a brand can do to address un unauthorized resellers? So the truth is, there are several things a brand can do, um, but I want to stress: Amazon themselves simply don't care. So although there are legal actions that you can take, there's nothing you can do within Amazon itself. You can't reach out to Amazon and ask them to, uh, you know, spam the other seller unless you know it's a fraudulent good, unless you know it's a fake good. If they're really selling your items, let's say they bought them cheap and now they're selling them online, there's very little you can do. What you can do is find out how they got hold of your stock and actually address the seller themselves. Um, so there are many software that we have and we offer like MapWatch that will actually show you if somebody who's selling your items goes below a price that you allow them to and in these cases you it's on you, you as the brand have the responsibility to reach out to the seller and make sure that they either don't do this or stop supplying to them straight out. Yeah, and we have, we have some experience with, with brands who have gone through uh, similar challenges and to be completely honest, Amazon does make it pretty difficult for you as a brand to to enforce the authenticity of your products. Uh, you have to report the counterfeit products one by one uh, and show them specific examples where they're, they're counterfeit. And honestly, the way Amazon views it is that the product reviews uh, and seller reviews, that essentially is their check and balance on whether the products are real or not. Uh, and so even though it is can be very frustrating in the short term, I think it's important for sellers to um, not necessarily get obsessed with the fact that you know their brand may be on Amazon with some counterfeit products um, and kind of take solace in the fact that over time the product reviews and the seller reviews uh, will eventually lead to that seller not being able to participate on the marketplace. Um, but I know it can be, you know, especially for brand owners, that can be a huge source of frustration. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to switch gears a little bit towards FBA. Um, we put out a web paper together on FBA and actually sent that out to everyone uh, in the chat box, so you can check that out if you want. Um, but Alice has a question. I guess could you, Smoly, could you speak towards the strategy behind having both an FBM and an FBA offer for one uh, given product? You mean the same item itself, specifically? Yes. Yeah, that's uh, we see sellers do that a lot. Um, there are several reasons. Uh, there are problems with FBA, and one of the things actually that you just mentioned specifically um, is is very relevant, which is the idea of fraud and fake items. If you're sending things stickerless to FBA, it's going to get commingled, which means that when Amazon take an FBA order under your name, they might send you an item that wasn't sent out by you. And sometimes you can be recorded as sending out a fake or faulty item, even though the item that you actually send to FBA is fine. A lot of sellers would sometimes have both FBA and FBA items because they want to ensure that if they are banned or if there's a problem selling this item via FBA, they still have enough inventory on hand in their own warehouses that if it's a really popular item, they can just carry on selling it without feeling the hiccup. On the same vein, if it's a very popular item, a lot of people like holding it in both FBA and FBM so that they balance their own stock. So yes, the majority of their sales probably go through FBA. Uh, it's better for them economically in some cases, but it nearly always sells for a higher price, so they're happy with that. But they know that specific items or specific times of the year um, run out very quickly and therefore they hold enough in FBM stock so that the minute their FBA runs out, they're still selling. The same is also true for items which are very expensive to sell through FBA. Big items or items that often sit on the shelf for a while, they may only want to send a small amount of stock to FBA to keep their costs low and again, the FBM acts as a backup, acts as a, a buffer or a filler in those times when, that's, when that happens. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, I guess, well, could you speak a little bit more generally about the, the value add of FBA? Um, it, there seems to be some people on the fence in terms of, you know, obviously FBA items 
take out an extra cost um, when when you actually sell those orders. But um, yeah, what, what is the value add of FBA, and how do you justify that that extra cost? Um, there's a very very good uh, question. This is something which you know our white paper ended up being. I think we planned it to be about 10 pages, and we ended up writing 30 pages regarding this one question. <clears throat> the main questions to ask yourself before selling FBA are as follows. First of all, do you have the manpower for fulfillment? A very simple question. If you're going to start hiring people and you have to start worrying about salaries and insurance just to get your first batch of items out there, sometimes it's economically viable just to go with FBA even at an inflated cost because you simply don't have the manpower to do the packing, the shipping and everything else required to send online. The one thing that FBA does better than anyone else in the world is logistics. If you want items to be packed, picked and shipped and sent to the right place, sometimes manpower alone is a reason to go there. You also have to think, for example, about what you're selling. Selling large items, selling heavy items or selling items which are prone to sit on the shelf for a long time are going to cost you a lot more FBA. Many sellers tactically don't send items with seasonal sales through FBA, so for example Christmas lights, because even though it's great just before Christmas, you know, two weeks after you may have a lot of merchandise on the shelf which you're simply not going to sell and then you have to pay Amazon either to send it back to you or destroy it. You also have to think about your volumes. If you're selling smaller amounts, sometimes FBM is quick and easy, especially if you're selling uh, jewelry, watches, um, electronics or other light cheap items which can sell rarely the same one item, you don't want Amazon to hold a, a gold watch or a gold pen that you only ever sell once a month, that you want to sell yourself. But if you have high turnover items such as office supplies where you know you're always going to sell at least X amount of day, then FBA makes a lot more sense. Um, the last thing I will say about FBM versus FBA is, is labeling. A lot of sellers have problems with the labeling requirements of FBA and you can get penalized for getting it wrong and sometimes the item is just sent straight back to you or gets lost. So sometimes there's an advantage of sticking with a system that you know you control your own destiny. If you're FBM, you can pack it yourself, you can ship it yourself and no one's gonna you know, penalize you if you can't label ex explicitly the way Amazon want you to. So there are this and, and many, many more reasons. I would strongly recommend everyone download the white paper. It is a, a very, very uh, rich understanding of kind of that, uh, both the high level and the tactical point of view when we're looking at this uh, question. Yeah, this is a very solid answer, Shmoy. Um Kind of more of a, a cut and dry question about FBA. You may or may not know this, but does the actual physical location of the product um, whether it's in, at an FC center or a fulfillment center in Arizona versus a fulfillment center in New York, uh, does that affect, um, I, I guess, buy box share at all? Um, officially, no. We've heard rumors of this. We investigated and we couldn't find any difference. In fact, we, we ran um, simultaneous, simultaneous ownership tests which is that when we ran the same query in Arizona and New York and LA and found out in all three locations did the same person win the buy box and it's normally almost exclusively yes. So unless there's one, there may be, and I stress, there may be one or two issues with perhaps groceries or, or flowers um, or some items which can or can't be sold in certain states. But as a general rule, 99% of the cases, it doesn't matter which fulfillment center your item's in. And Amazon normally are very good at balancing it. So if they notice that a certain item is more popular in one place than another place, they themselves, you'll see, you know, in your fulfillment bands and it goes in transit, and they'll move it from one place to another place where they believe it will sell better. Great, great. Um, so, so I guess going back to, to feedback, seller feedback, um, well, I guess it's more so seller rating. So Ryan has a question. Uh, you mentioned a perfect order metric in one of your slides. I guess could you speak towards that a little bit more? Yeah, the perfect order metric is slightly odd. Um, in Amazon, you can see within your seller central the percentage of your orders that were given a perfect score. And a perfect score is 110%. 
Um, we've written a few blog posts about this, and the truth is it's not something that we have a lot of time to discuss right now, but essentially a perfect score is when you go above and beyond what Amazon would expect from you. Um, it, uh, it doesn't have a massive impact itself on the buy book share, but what it does do is it leads to your total seller rating, and that has a big effect. Um, having 100 or 110 is never going to be a deal, deal breaker. Having you know 100 or minus 500 is. So while perfect score is important, it's more important that you get, you know, one item from a 500 up to a from a minus 500 up to 100. So, so to say that it's more important to get one bad item right than it is to get 10 good items great. So perfect score is nice; it can have an effect, but it's not as critical as just making sure that that one item which could go wrong doesn't go wrong. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, one, I think probably our last question is going to be on product reviews, which typically people don't talk about when it comes to buy box ownership, but A, does, does product reviews have any effect over the buy box? Uh, none whatsoever. The product review will change how likely the specific item is to be found by Amazon search engines, as we've discussed in the last few days, and will affect the discoverability of this item, but it does not define in any way which seller actually owns the buy box share for the specific item. Yeah, and, and I will say that if you're a brand, you're, you're definitely interested in increasing product reviews because while it doesn't affect buy box ownership, it will affect the overall conversion rate of that detail page, um, you know, whether that product is appealing to buy or not. Um, so that's pretty much all the time. I guess as a last note from me, um, we will definitely be sending out the recordings and the slides late next week, so just, just have that on the record. Um, but Shmuley, I guess, do you have any final thoughts? No, again, exactly what you said. I want to mirror the thanks from CPC Strategy. It's been a pleasure having you all here. I hope you've learned something in the last three days. I hope that you've seen something that you didn't know and made you went, ah, that's interesting. Um, we live to educate, we live to share, we live to help, and we hope we achieved all three. Thank you all Thanks. for listening. Yeah, thank you, Shmuley. Uh, we, we genuinely appreciate it. I thought that you closed out the virtual summit uh, extremely well, and you obviously have a, a ton of knowledge about the buy box, and we appreciate you sharing with us. I also want to, since we're closing out the summit, I want to thank John. Uh, John from uh, our team has put in a ton of effort to work with, with Pat and uh, Paul and Shmuley on their presentations to help them prep for their presentations, to write the copy for landing pages, to promote the virtual summit, to handle all of the audience questions that have been coming in for the last three days. And John is absolutely a superstar, and I want to thank you for all the effort that you put into the virtual summit, John. I also want to thank um, Pat and Paul from Seller Labs and Shmuley from Feedvisor. I felt like the quality of the content was extremely high, um, definitely on par with you know uh, conferences speaking about Amazon. I think that you know to, over the last three days we put out some of the best, um, highest level content uh, on Amazon. So we appreciate that, and, and thank you guys for all the effort you put in. And lastly, I just want to thank the audience. Uh, the audience has put in or has you know, went over the webinars for the last three days. They participated. Uh, they've asked questions, and we genuinely appreciate your attention. The last call to action for those of you who are still on the live. Uh, webinar is to fill out a, a survey which GoToMeeting will give you, which is feedback that we'll use for future summits and for future webinars. We're already uh, planning a panel with Pat and Shmuley and Paul uh, where we just kind of go through uh, like a Q&A session but for 60 or 90 minutes to get all three of them on that panel together. And at CBC Strategy we're planning another Google Shopping Summit. And so please give us feedback on what we did well, how we can improve. Uh, because like Shmuley said, it's our goal to educate, and your feedback helps us to better uh, educate and give value to you. So please fill out that feedback now, and we appreciate your time and attention over the last three days, and we're signing off for the 2015 Amazon Virtual Summit.